Welcome to the Basketball Podcast. Really excited today to have Champions League head coach from Anvil in Poland, Igor Milicek. Igor, welcome to the podcast. Hi, uh, I'm very proud to be here. And let's see what we can do. <laughs> well, coach, you can do a lot of things. I mean, you're a rising star in European coaching circles. I've heard your name from a number of people. And you know, we'll talk a little bit about Anwil and the Polish team that you've taken over and you've been there for four years and their first year in Champions League and, you know, how you're building that program has been tremendous. But we've got to start with something I posted relatively recently on Twitter, and that was an off the backboard play that was by design. Can you talk a little bit about how that came about? Well, yeah, definitely. There is a lot of things in basketball that I think it should be used more common on a daily basis, but we as coaches, we are afraid to dance of uh, actually of a fear to not succeed. But that's one of the situations which I figured out. I want to post up my point guard. And then after a few times, they start denying that. And my team went frustrated. How are we going to go into that? In order to find them comfortable with all that situation, I said, okay, let's not think something complicated. Let's just go. If they front us, we're going to throw the ball off the backboard. It ball is bouncing off the backboard down. It's never bouncing up. So point guard with decent athleticism can pick it up and just lay it up. So we did that on practice a few times and guys liked it. So I said before one game, I said, okay, this is going to be a third play of the game. We usually starting with some special situation, first, second and third play of the game. And I uh, announced it for TV commentators before the game. Watch out, guys, don't pass off the backboard, which he caught it and laid it up. So it made a big, big fuss around it by that play. But that was just common play. And I think a lot of coaches know that angle of passing the ball. Well, it's a tremendous message to all of us as coaches and something that we try and talk about a lot. And that's for coaches, you don't have to follow traditional norms. You don't have to follow cultural norms in coaching. You need to do what you believe and in a lot of cases, we need to be braver as coaches because there's a lot of things that make sense that we simply don't do because of the way the media would perceive it or, you know, tradition would perceive it. And that's a great example. As you just said, it's, that was just the most effective pass to be able to complete the play if the defense covered them this way. Exactly. We are running that play on a common basis and there is two ways to defend it, or deny it, or play behind. If they deny, there is a backboard pass. If the defense covered them this way. Exactly. We are running that play on a common basis, and there is two ways to defend it, or deny it, or play behind. If they deny, there is a backboard pass who, with cutting wings from opposite side, from corners to up, opening uh, really clear area where we can pass and nobody can help. If they don't deny, they play behind. We just put the ball on low post for our guard who has a mismatch advantage. He's a big size guard and he can play one-on-one. So at the end of the day, it's really simple situation. Well, it's great. And again, we're not here to talk about the off the backboard play and to get coaches to run that, but it's just, again, another great example. And I love that you've said as well that it was something that was practiced. It wasn't something that was improvised in the moment. It was something that was practiced as a deliberate thing to take advantage of a defensive weakness. So coach, let's talk a little bit about Anwell and, you know, the team you took over because it leads into the conversation that we're going to, but Anwell was not in good shape when you took over four years ago. And now you're playing in the Champions League. Can you talk a little bit about the challenges of coaching, you know, a lower budgeted club against bigger budgeted clubs and certainly in some cases more talented clubs? Coach, there is like few issues that goes along with the story of Anvil, but I don't know if I can make parallels with the coaches and organization in the States because it's totally, I don't want to talk even about NBA because NBA comparing to what we're playing in Europe is a totally different sport. It's not even the same sport. Just name is the same, but the rules and how we go with it, it's totally different. Yeah, I hope that coaches in the States uh, will find parallels that they can rely to. What I'm saying here is like when you get the team with the lower budget, since I was becoming a coach, 
there was an issue that you cannot get immediately great job and with great budget and with great players. So you are getting what you're getting. And with that, you have to get best out of it. So when I was basketball player for almost 30 years, and then I jumped into the coaching shoes or suit just from day-to-day basis when I finished my career. Next day, I was assistant coach for half a year and then later on as a coach. Within that process, I was thinking what kind of coach I want to be. And when I finished my career, next day, I was assistant coach for half a year and then later on as a coach. Within that process, I was thinking what kind of coach I want to be and what I want to do with the team that I am coaching. And this is a situation also with Anvo. The team was like on a verge of bankruptcy, didn't even manage to go to the playoffs a year before. We didn't have great budget. And I was thinking how we can make something out of it. So thinking what situation as a player I didn't like and I liked, I wanted to put that together as a coach. And in a situation of what you said, multiple defenses, I'm thinking that we have more control on defensive side as a coaches and then on offensive side. So we started the first season with a limited budget with the players that were okay. They didn't have much offers. And we made a season very successful. Everybody was happy. And at the end of the day, I was happy with it, thinking that with this kind of players, if we manage to do that, what's going to be if we get even better players with bigger frame, with bigger wingspan, with uh, bigger athletic abilities. So from year to year, we try to develop that system in order to become something that we are known for. And last year we won championship that gave us a Euro competition, like first time after 10 years. And the whole organization is on a different level now. We are one of the best teams in Poland. We are appreciated in, uh, in Europe, how we played and, and organized organization-wise also. So everything was developing really, really smooth, and I'm very happy for that. Well, I'm happy for you too. And Organization-wise also. So everything was developing really, really smooth, and I'm very happy for that. Well, I'm happy for you too. And parallel to a lot of coaches is is just being under-resourced relative to your competition. I mean, that's not unique. That's normal and that's your circumstance, then you have to find a way within those circumstances to compete. And one of the ways that you did is that you said it already, that you felt like you have more control on defense. So can you explain your, and basically from my understanding, you switch defenses, you play some one three one, you play some two two one full court pressure, uh, you play some switching man, and you play some multiple different defenses. Can you explain a little bit your system of defense? Well, as I said, I was point guard for most of my career on different levels of uh, European basketball. And what I found out, what knowledge that I bring like as a coach was the knowledge defense you can easily adopt. Doesn't matter if it's hard show, if it's contained, if it's side, blue, wrapping defense, you can adapt. And I was coming with the idea, why not to make this tougher for point guards, for the coaches? And since basically we're playing four different defenses, we're playing man-to-man defense, which is a defense where we're using hard show defense on pick and roll situations. We're not letting point guards to dribble a lot. Then we're having one three one zone. We are also playing, I think it's in the States, it's called one one three matchup zone. Okay, yeah. Something like that. Uh, referring to that as a matchup, yeah, you're running a matchup zone defense. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Something like that, which is, it looks like 1 3 1 zone, and a lot of teams are confused. Are we playing 1 3 1 zone? Even now, it's fourth year that we're running that. Some teams or some, you know, you're making chaos on other teams. Yeah. Usually, again, after the free throws, we are in 2 2 1 full court zone defense. So we are sometimes coming back to the zone, actually, this matchup zone. And sometimes we're coming back to the man-to-man, even to the switch defense. And it's very challenging to train the players in order to be able to go from one defense to another in order not to make bigger mistakes. But as it's tough for us to practice, 
it's very challenging for other teams to adapt. I was thinking if I would be a point guard, I would come to the front court and see that they are doing something. I would take a look at my coach, what I should call. A coach would call something, then I would call back that for other four players. And that's like five, six seconds already lost. Since we have now 24 seconds in Europe to run an offense, it's like those seconds that we steal from them on a full court the call the something, then I would call back line, that for other four players. Side, and that's like five, six back. seconds already lost. Since we have now 24 seconds in Europe to run an offense, it's like those seconds that we steal from them on a full court zone press or by changing defenses and they are not sure what we're playing. It's a tremendous asset for us in order to be more successful defensively. So uh, we coach, coach, let me just, we, we're going to get into the, how you practice because that's fascinating part of it too. And I also want to get into how you or the lessons you've learned as an offensive coach, having played this system too, since you ultimately will play against certain different types of defenses. But let's start with a term because you're kind of referring to it, but I read in an article you talking about this as a goal of creating dizziness in opponents. That's what you're talking about when you're talking about confusing the defense or the offenses. You're talking about creating dizziness in them so they're not exactly... Like, like I said, we are playing this uh, very aggressive defense when we're playing man-to-man. So it's hard show defense where we're attacking guards with the ball who are playing pick and roll situation like in europe it's 80 percent pick and roll situations uh, within the offense so if we are attacking them they have to defend they have to defend that we are trying to make them pass the ball or do the things that we want them to do not necessarily them knowing that but we are trying to make this kind of uh, pressure on their point guard but adding this one three one zone plus matchup zone who looks like a one three one. You come into a situation that point guard really don't know what we're running. He's turning head towards the coach where they're losing some seconds in order to what they prepared, if they prepared. So there is very few teams that they can come unprepared and play against us and come out successful. So that in order to what they prepared, if they prepared. So there is very few teams that they can come unprepared and play against us and come out successful. So that's another thing why we are running all those things. The players are running in circles and they are ending up being guarded. It doesn't matter what they do. Coach, it's going to lead into what you talked about too, which is like especially based on your schedule. Teams have short preparation times and you are a unique preparation that they would not have seen the game before, the week before in a lot of cases. So that creates dizziness too, in terms of that they have to do something very unique to prepare for you. That's one thing that we tried to do this year in the Champions League, which was a little bit awkward because we don't have like a situation that we can keep like core of seven, eight, nine players for the next year. We also having problems, let's say only 20% team in Europe this year, we added seven or eight players. So that's like college coach have like eight rookies on the team. So that was challenging in order to put that system. But I was thinking if we are managed to get part of this system ahead of before season starts, that we will get into the situation where teams who are playing in Europe having like two days to prepare a game for us. And within two days, it's tough to prepare against one three one against matchup, against switching defense, which they don't have to face common in their leagues or against teams that they're facing. So we were playing on that card that they will not be prepared for those situations and that we can take advantage defensively within those situations when teams are within one practice. When you travel, you have one practice to prepare a game. And then to prepare a game against like three or four different defenses that you used to play against. Defenses, although it seems less and less. But this is very uncommon in European basketball. Pressing is very uncommon that I've seen. Zone is a little bit more common, but switching to multiple defenses seems to be less common. So how did you get buy-in from your players who may have come from more traditional systems to be able to buy into this philosophy that you're selling them? Well, that's the main thing. Within the players that I had, nobody gave them really a chance to, to accomplish nothing big. 
And with the, okay, that was a process within first two defenses that we picked up, then third, adding the third one, making surprise on certain part of the season. And they feel hyped when they see that something is helping them to be taken as a stars and a lot of uh, publicity coming on to them suddenly when they do something right. And they felt that other teams are having something is helping them to be taken as a stars and a lot of uh, publicity coming on to them suddenly when they do something right. And they felt that other teams are having this, like you said, dizziness playing against them. They liked it. And then when they picked it up, that's the main part. You know, as a coach, that you can make Phil Jackson tactics and if players are not picking that up, that doesn't work. And it can be plain tactic, some simple things. If team picks it up, that can be a great, great defense. So I think in year by year, my players are finding out that type of running defensive systems, giving them extra value. And then because of that, they are hyped. At one point of the season, the players were just waiting when we're going to switch to alternative defenses. And that was really nice to see. Yeah, it's a lot of eating. So coach, let's dive into it a little bit. Let's start with the 2-2-1 full court. What is the goal? What, and you said primarily against, actually, let's start with that. When are you using these systems? Do you have, you said free throws is 2-2-1s primarily, but is this based on feel or is it scripted? Like, for example, on a score, you're in this, or on a miss, you're in this, or on a make, et cetera, et cetera. Or is it just by feel or by specific opponent scout that you're choosing which defense to play? This is by uh, scouting. Usually, we're trying to feel the team, how they respond on a zone press after the free throws. We are not trying to steal. Eventually, if they give us opportunities to steal the ball, we go for it. But we want to steal time. Like I said, there is 24-second shot clock. In Europe, after the offensive rebound or after the steal, there is now 14 seconds for the shot clock. That's very limited time in order to organize. If we steal out of those 24 seconds, if we steal like seven or six plus two of those 24 seconds, if we steal like seven or six plus two or three until they organize something, we are down to one play or one side pick or one top pick, which is easy to defend. So we want to steal time, and we are usually running this to the free throws. Then if it happens that there is some point guards or coaches who are really prepared and they're breaking this, uh, this zone press easily and we're having trouble, we're just moving away from it. On the other hand, last year on a, on a semifinal, do or die game, we were down 16. We put that zone press against, che- at that time, champion. And within three minutes, we gained the league after being 16 down. So we were running that even after our basket. So as a coach, you always have feeling when something is working, when it's not working. And with this zone press, it's more of a situation. It's more of a situation that I want to provoke my players to be active. They cannot play full court zone press if they are not active. You're going to get slaughtered immediately if you are not active. So sometimes I'm just using that to wake up my team and to make my team play on a certain way that I want them to play. Well, it's great. And it it allows you to pull some strings with your team, but it also allows you to do specific opponent prep as well. So, you know, lots of flexibility in terms of that going back and forth. So in terms of the 2-2-1, let's start there. What are you trying to force out of, again, not necessarily steals, although you take them, but what's the primary goal when you play the 2-2-1? Well, within all these defenses, what we are running, like one through one, you can run one through one on a different ways. There is trapping defense in the corners. There is allowing point guard to have uh, drives to the side. The teams go in the middle area of the floor. We want a point guard to dribble the ball in the middle area where usually point guards are smaller. And we, with active hands on top two guards, we are making pressure in order for him to make some kind of easy turnover within the passes that they are making and trying to break our our zone. We are trying to make the ball pass the half-court line in the middle. So that's the first thing that we want to do. 
we are trapping only only in a few situations and that's if the ball goes really really on the side or if they are trying to cross the floor by dribbling within the circle of central circle of the floor then we are trying to trap the ball and trying to go to for the steal so pretty much we want them to pass 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 back and forward in order to lose time so Perfect. And main, so any passes backwards, all that. So pretty much we want them to pass, pass, pass back and forward in order to lose time. So Perfect. And main, so any passes backwards, all that's fine. You said you do get into a little bit of situational denial if there's certain players you want to keep the ball out of. Or does that happen within trapping or does that happen in other ways? Well, if ball goes to the side, we transform to one, two, two. And that basically gives the pass back to the point guard. But within the ball in the point guard's hands, when they cross the half-court line, we're trying to deny point guard as much as possible in order, again, to achieve those stealing of a few seconds from their shot clock. When the point guard gets the ball, he's running and chasing the ball from the forward or power forward to get the ball in order to set the play. So we are playing again on the same card, stealing time from opponents in order to have less time to attack us. Wow, that's great. And obviously your players have bought in that are, you are giving up in the two two one that you know, for example, this would cue you to know that a team is prepared for you, but also potentially that you might have to switch your defense. So what are the things that beat your two two one that teams do? Well, first thing is like really, really quick point guard. If he goes through my players, obviously they will have numbers advantage on the front court, and that can end up with the easy layup. Even if they shoot like transition three or deep two, that's like kind of what we want to give, give away within that. We want to change the tempo, like every zone uh, full court press or zone press, want to have like different players holding the ball. So within this, very seldom point guard is running at two players to beat them up. So he's getting rid of the ball, getting ball back, getting rid of the ball, and then on the ball, getting ball back, getting rid of the ball, and then on the front court, they are having problems to get the ball and organize the set. What we are having problems is to match up. And then when they go to the front court, we are sometimes in a different matchups or matchups that they are not so good for us. So those are two situations where we can end up having problems. And then if we are like uh, repeatedly having those kind of problems, we are just deciding not to go zone press no more on that game, or at least at, at that time of uh, that period of the game. Sure. You, sometimes you just take it off and they relax and then you can add it back or obviously you can remove it completely. So it's good yeah, stuff. When, when they change point guard or they, they, they subbed other like two less good shooters off the ball, off guard situations that they are not so good shooters. So we get back to those situations again. But yeah, we have to, we get back to those situations again. But yeah, we have to analyze that before the game, what situation can happen. And I'm having great assistant coaches who are really, really into uh, scouting. So it's easier for me to pull some strings during the game. Uh, it's great. And coach, the one three one. So there's a fascination with the one three one. I would say it's not a very common defense, and I get asked a lot about how to attack it, which we'll get into. But in terms of the one three one and the things that you're emphasizing, I assume are you are you playing somewhat traditional in terms of that your the aim of your one three one is to force the offense to dribble into the funnels? Is that what you're trying to do? Pretty much, but why we start playing this one through one is to again there is a lot of american point guards in uh, poland or in europe and now to cut that to the basics what american usually within that defense they are not able to get to the paint and they are not able to do what they want to do hold the ball dribble drive and kick or drive and dish or shoot the ball so we are making constant pressure on point guard and not giving point guard to go into those situations where they feel most comfortable with. Yeah, we are trying to make them drive to the funnels where we stop them with a big guy, but our big guy who is playing in the center position 
on a situation of pick is very high up. It's almost a, a trap. So we are playing kind of very aggressive one through one defense. Well, it's great. It's great to understand why you're playing it as well. And that makes sense, obviously, the different level of point guard that you have to play against constantly in Europe. But so what do you do? Are you denying passes to the middle? Is that what the center's doing in the middle? Are they denying passes to? Well, the issue within what we want is against constantly in Europe. But so what do you do? Are you denying passes to the middle? Is that what the center's doing in the middle? Are they denying passes to? Well, the issue within what we want is not to get the ball on high post or low post. So we are trying to deny those passes. We don't, like every 1-3-1, one, one, we don't want to give the direct passes because that's going to kill any defense, zone defense, direct passes. So we want low passes, we want advanced passes, we want slow passes. So pretty much the point man at the top, he is not giving this side-to-side direct passes. And uh, wingmans on the sides are not giving direct passes to the corners, where at the same time they have to make pressure on the ball. There's just one like, kind of square at the top on the half court, on the both sides of the half court, where we are not guarding aggressive. On all other situations, the ball has to be guarded really, really aggressive. Or is there something different in terms of that? No. Exactly like you said, we call this guy a monster because he has to cover from corner to corner. And again, we are knowing that those are weak spots, but if I had to give up something, I would give up corner three. There is a, like, there is tough situation. We don't want to give it up, but if it needs to be something where we had to leak, it can be the corner because if they miss, there is very a big chances that we're going to have great transition or fast break against them. If they put two players on offensive rebound plus guy who's shooting on a corner, that's like three players on a kind of next to the baseline. So that gives us on a closeout on the corners. And again, to push them to the middle where big guy has to drop on a low post position. And then again, big guy is one who gets on a guy who is penetrating. Are there any scenarios within your one three one or and we'll talk about matchup zone maybe a little bit later, but where your players switch into man within the flow? For example, in one three ones before, I've seen it when a player dribbles and goes dead, that sometimes mm-hmm. the defense will shift into a man denial because the player's dead. Or there's situations where you'll trap out of it. Do you do some stuff like that sometimes specific to opponents or situations? Well, if player is, let's say, on a um, non-shooting area and we provoke him to, to catch the ball and he's dead, then we jump out off him and make him to shoot the ball from eight and a half, nine meters, or to have this, to not be comfortable where he want to pass because all the passes are denied and a half, nine meters, or to have this, to not be comfortable where he want to pass because all the passes are denied and he's by himself wide open, not knowing what to do. So that's one situation where we're trying to deny all the passes. We do you don't, have a call for that coach? Is there a call that you can share with us that your players would call? Dave Smart is one of the best coaches in the world, and now you can learn from him with never-before-available access. Three all-access practices and one defensive coaching clinic are available at davesmartbasketball.com. What makes these all-access practice and clinic videos so unique? Dave Smart has won 12 national championships and has a winning percentage of 92%. Dave Smart's Force We Can defensive system is world-renowned and has never been shared in this way before. World-renowned and has never been shared in this way before. Dave Smart has a winning record in over 50 games versus NCAA Division I teams, having beaten Wichita State, Baylor, Wisconsin, and many others. Dave Smart is recognized by Jay Wright, Mick Cronin, Jay Triano, and many other top coaches in the world as one of the best minds in basketball. Learn from one of the greatest minds in the game who opened his doors and shared the game with us from one of the most successful basketball programs in the world. Go to davesmartbasketball.com now to learn more and to purchase all four videos. So we don't trap. In the corners, we don't trap within one-three-one zone. What we do, 
when they're playing high pick, usually they, they're trying to be the first man by high pick. We draw the big man all the way up, and it can be on 10 meters in order to this middle area, to the side, and then my two players who were on the ball become off-ball situations. Big guy drops on a, on a free throw, and, and point man is, like, again, denying the reverse direct pass, and wingman picks up the ball. So that's, like, maybe not so common situation in 1-3-1 one, one zone, what we run. Yeah, no, but it makes sense, right? I mean, especially the first one where you go through and a player picks it up in an area where they can't make a play. It's Mm -hmm. run away from them, and then you get an extra defender to disrupt and deny. No, it's great stuff. And it, it, again, again, paints a picture of some of the disruptions or dizziness, as you said, that you can put the offense into. Now, I do get asked commonly how to attack a 1-3-1. So what are some of the things that have been most effective attacking your 1-3-1 defense? Well, the teams who are finding a way to, to pass the ball to the high post, it's always killing us. And then extra pass from there is where you scramble pretty much. So with great three, then extra pass from there is where you scramble pretty much. So with great three-point shooting against us, sometimes, let's say on the last game, we, we put the zone defense for, for three possessions and two of them were like seven and a half, eight meter threes. So we, we wrapped it up, we put it deep in our pocket and didn't come back again with one through one zone. But there is kind of a low pass on a help side where they make a flare back screen for the guy who is going for the lob. That was one of the teams who tried to do that against us. But from the scouting, we know that's uh, the way how to break one through one and we were ready for it. That's one of the way if you're not ready, you can break the one through one zone easily. And also, uh, if you give up low post situation, then there is a lot of situation that can hurt us within different spacings, within different cuts. So, Coach, getting into the switching man-to-man defensive stuff, so what are you guys doing within that defense to cover up bad matchups? I would assume most of the time, most teams are attacking you on the perimeter with a little on big matchup. But what are some of the things that you do on the perimeter Let's start with on the perimeter, and then we'll talk about the post after. What are some things you're doing to cover up some of the matchups? Well, first of the things that we are implementing in our man-to-man defense is like back line defense. That's very common in the NCAA, right? In the world, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And we are trying to make that like three players on the ball, so one player on the ball plus two closest guys to also to back lines, but very high up in order at the same time not to give a direct pass to the first guy next to the ball and to be at position where common defense would sag to the ball happens, right? So that's our initial position when where we supposed to, from normal defense, where we sag towards the ball when he's penetrating and then getting back on closeout if he pass, that sag in position is our initial position. So... Within that, we're already covering this mismatch situation with the three players. But we're having on perimeter also situation where we flash on the ball and get back to our man. So we are trying to, if players is dribbling guy who's going to play on a mismatch situation one-on-one against our big guy, he's dribbling with the right hand. We're flashing towards him with the first guy on the right-hand side, towards him like we go on a trap and we get back. So we call that flash. Okay, so you're basically, in simple terms, like, which is great, it's basically a run and jump back to it, right? Exactly. The players leaving. Exactly. Now, where is the, the post is leaving to go where? To the weak side, traditionally? So you're rotating up to, if you're off the ball. So the player rotates to the ball. The player on the ball leaves to the weak side. And then the weak side or the ball side would rotate up to cover the player who ran and jumped. Is that how it's going? <laughs> Well, pretty much the flashing we use only when ball is in the middle. Like it's not on 45 and... Right, when, only in the middle, okay. Yeah, then we're flashing towards the ball, but we are getting back to our own man. We are not like rotating. We are jumping on, on the ball and getting back to our own man. So pretty much we want to make the guy with the ball change the hand or pick up the ball, like thinking that he's going to be trapped. Okay. Okay. We are not trapping the ball, so we don't have to really rotate because right. the guy who is on the ball, he stays on the ball. Nobody 
at the end of the day, nobody helps him. We don't double, we don't trap. We just go, show ourselves, and get back to the demands that we cover. Perfect. So a run and jump. Perfect. So a run and jump with no trap. Cool. So, yeah. Coach, let's talk about the post then. What are some ways if they're trying to exploit a matchup to the post? And, and maybe I'm wrong, but that seems to be less and less because it seems to be faster and more effective to attack it from the perimeter. But if they're trying to go into the post, what are some ways that you're trying to counter that? <sighs> Well, like you already said, a lot of teams' tendency is to attack from perimeter, but the, the rules are changing, and the big guys are not protected as they should be. So if big guy enters in the paint and then he's trying to step in or seal in, and the guard uh, is faster and he's going around him, big guy extends his elbows up, he hits him suddenly, offensive foul. If he stays there for two seconds, it's three seconds. So it's very tough for the big guys to have this kind of uh, immediately in the middle of the pain, this uh, matchup. So the players and the coaches, they, they end up with attacking from perimeter with the guards, those mismatch situations. But if they come to the situations of low post perimeter with the guards, those mismatch situations. But if they come to the situations of low post, even if it's not mismatch and we have some foul trouble, we use trap on a baseline, we call that black. Like, uh, night eats you. If you have the ball, night goes around you. You have to reinforce the baseline, and then we have a guy who is uh, on a baseline trapping, very active. We form a triangle, like a zone, with three other players, and that's how we are protecting ourselves from mismatches or size advantages on low balls. So if you have to trap, you're coming from the baseline side. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. No, it's good stuff. And it's good for coaches to understand and think about. I mean, there's you're giving up something no matter what you play and understanding what's going to beat you or what potentially they can attack you and exploit you is obviously important to think about because it, it directly affects how you cover it up. So that's the other part about this. No, that's, exa- no, that's exactly what we as coaches, we have to have in mind. What's a situation that can happen on the floor when we force to some things? And then... Players have to know what we're going to do then. There is the worst situation for the coaches when players are saying, oh, this happened, I was there, and then other players is, is saying, I was helping, and you were not helping me. No, you have to have rules for each situation. You have to be prepared for each situation. And then when you put the film after the game, you don't have to talk. Players are saying, okay, that's my mistake. I didn't do that. This is his mistake. He didn't do that. And it's clear situation. That's where where we as a coaches, we have to step up and make the really, I believe, in rules in defense. You cannot make rules in offense because that's talent and a lot of different stuff. But in defense, definitely, I believe that rules in defense helps. And if players know how to react in certain situation on the floor, how we want to go. If we're going to do it right, that's a different story. If we, But... If players know how to react on it, then it's just a matter if we are practiced enough or we are in a system that this is natural for the players to do so, such situations. Again, really effective system, especially, you know, based on, as you're saying, I mean, the better players you get, the better this is going to be. And it's shown, obviously, in your results as well. Coach, let's talk about practicing because there's a challenge to playing or there's a challenge to pressing, there's a challenge to playing zone that maybe isn't thought of as much sometimes when you're choosing what to do. And that's the impact it has on your offensive development. Because you're spending a lot of time on different defensive systems in practice that you may not play against, how do you counter that to be able to help your man-to-man offense improve against improve against what will be the majority of the defenses you face, which are man-to-man? Well, that's also one of the challenging things for the coaches. Even if you having, I don't know, contained defense on a pick and roll situations, you are playing on practice against contained defense. How are you going to play against side defense or how are you going to play against trapping defense or hard show defense if you're not practicing like that? So pretty much within our system, this develops players to find solutions within different defenses that we run and they know where the holes in each system, there is a holes, obviously, and they know how to find them. So that refers to offensive systems. If I'm thinking how to, to break the offenses, opponent teams with my defense, I'm thinking, 
what we can run in offense in order to be able to resolve situation versus different type of defenses. So that's one talent we have in order to give them the best tools to solve this kind of problems. Obviously, my players know how to break the easier way, how to break a matchup zone or 1-3-1 one, one zone rather than other players who are not facing that on, on common on daily basis. But it is challenging also for me to, when we're playing hard show defense, how to attack contained defense and how to practice that during the preparation for the game within two days or one day when we have only limited time to prepare the game. So we make this different type of defenses like common. I'm trying to find a set that can work against different defenses that we will face. Well, it is a common problem for all coaches, and that's that's just the time, the time you have available to be able to develop things. And it is fascinating because I've talked to coaches who are very, very problem for all coaches, and that's that's just the time, the time you have available to be able to develop things. And it is fascinating because I've talked to coaches who are very, very strict and say, in practice, we will never change. If we're a hard show team, we will never do anything other than a hard show because I worry about its impact or the messaging to my players if we say, listen, now we're going to go soft or drop or ice or whatever it is. But the reality is your offense never improves against those things unless you play against it. So the flexibility that you're talking about is really important to your offensive players' development. Definitely. We go sometimes, even uh, on the practices, we are trying to play what the next team going to play against us for certain 15 minutes, uh, I don't know, 10 minutes, two times 15 minutes by practice. But even with us playing hard show defense, we have situation that we cannot play hard show defense. Let's say double high. If you play dry out within like eight meter difference between two players, and that's very tough to, to defend by one player. If four men is a shooter and the guy in a corner is a shooter, one guy cannot cover that area. So also in, in a transition, if they're running transition well, you cannot set up your team while they're sc- scrambling and sprinting back defensively in order to run harsh defense. At least I believe it's not possible to run with a high percentage of accuracy in those kind of situations. There is also two other situations where we have playing different defenses than hard show, but our main defense is hard show, and we are referring to that like five-player defense. So when we have to go against contained defense, it's like a little bit weird, but we have to prepare somehow because on a hard show defense, my goal is point guard has to release the ball as fast as possible. We have to prepare somehow because on a hard show defense, my goal is point guard has to release the ball as fast as possible in order to create advantage. But on contained defense, he has to draw this big guy out in order to create advantage on other positions to shoot for himself or to pass. So we have to a little compromise in order to get best results and having players be comfortable with all those situations. The question for a sense. lot... Yeah, it makes total sense. And and again, some coaches out there who are obviously not professional coaches or not dealing with that level of player might be saying, okay, is there value to me doing switching defenses, multiple defenses? Maybe it's only two at a youth level. Well, clearly there's an advantage in the sense that, as you said, you're creating dizziness and confusion for a lower skilled player. But the question is then, are you taking away offensive development? And the only way to marry those things is to do what you're saying in terms of Getting your players to be your players to be adaptable to different situations. I'm not sure. Does Anwell have a junior program? Do you run some of this stuff with your junior program? Uh, yes, one of the coaches. We don't have advanced junior program, but one of the coaches is trying to run the same situations. What we are running, he's running one three one zone. Okay, matchup matchup zone is tough for the kids to pick up, but one three one zone is giving him great results and, and packing line defense with the hard showing also giving him uh, great results. And people, uh, kids are coming into the situation where they know where to go, where they have to be. And we have, let's say, rookies coming from the colleges after four years of college. They don't really know those situations and they don't know how to react in those. It's like learning like new things and learning process for them starts when they're 22. 
Well, it, it, we could get into a whole conversation about that alone too. But coach, I imagine in your practice too, a lot of it is is offense versus even four and four. Some situations are not uh, realistic, and I'm trying to make even shooting practice into the realistic game situations. So when we are playing defense on hard show, it's like we are good as it's good our last guy in defense in the corner opposite of the ball. If he is doing his job in, in this pick and roll defense, then we as a team going to do a great job. Without him, our pick and roll defense doesn't exist. So four on four, it's not really how we can practice when we want to play five on five, actually five against two players who are involved in pick and roll situations. So pretty much we are trying to, here in Anvil, we are trying to make everything through five on five, Okay, one on one, that's a different story. Two on two, isolation situation on uh, one quarter of the floor and stuff like that. But whatever we practice, like tactically, it's five on five within. Uh, whatever we practice, like tactically, it's five on five within uh, regulations. How we're we doing, and it's offense defense. Well, you're speaking my language. I'm a huge fan of that, and I think too many coaches remove context especially if you're talking about defensive situations like you are, context to the other players because we can be as strong as we want at the point of the ball, but it's the players off the ball that make a defense strong. So uh, having five-on-five five situations obviously helps build that. And then the other part I imagine for you is you just don't have time. You don't have time to do all these little breakdown drills because as quickly as possible, you've got to get them to understand the content that you're trying to get them to understand for that next game. As you said, your games come quickly. Exactly. Coach, there is, like in 24 seconds, there is eight to six different situations on the floor. Transition pick, then they go handoff with a four-man, let's say, in flow offense of five players. Then it comes like with a four-man, let's say, in flow offense of five players. Then it comes like maybe some stagger situation with side pick with a five-man. Uh, turns into the stagger situation, like I said. Then, let's say, late shot clock, they put the ball on the top and they're playing high pick. All those situations, we defend as a five players. And in order to be successful, my five players has to work within these six, eight situations like one. And if we miss like one player out of it, it's not working. And that's why it needs a lot of time to, to go five on five in order to have everybody at the same page that we cannot get surprised by the teams. Even if we didn't scout them well or we don't have, if they run, let's say, something else than, than six or seven plays that we are prepared for them. So, like you said, it's wasting time for... Another thought that I had, which is one of the advantages that you probably have playing multiple defenses especially mixing in the one three one in the matchup zone is that, you know, the dominant, dominant offensive thing in all of basketball is the pick and roll. So you're in a lot of cases, especially playing one three one matchup zone, you're removing traditional pick and roll from the offense as an opportunity, right? That all the pick and rolls are distorted if they run them because the traditional spacing, the traditional understanding of where the, the gaps would be all that changes because you're in a zone or in you're in a one three one. Have you found that a little bit that teams are running less pick and roll against you? Coach, that's bull eye. That's where you hit the point of what we're doing. I'm trying to do is to take a ball from the, the best player or the player who creates most for them. And that's pick and roll situation. Within those matchup, all the picks are switched by the guards with them. And that's pick and roll situation. Within those matchup, all the picks are switched by the guards. Within within one three one, we guarding point guard with two guys. Definitely, like on top pick, there is two, sometimes three players on him. And we are not allowing even in man to man defense. We are hard showing, and again, our guard is going over and under and protecting this penetration to the paint with guys jumping into the back line kind of defense, we are protecting these uh, advantages which guards are having from pick and roll situations. And we came to the situation the teams are not scouting us. They don't want to have something. They just go say, okay, just go against them and play, shoot the ball, run the, run the floor and shoot the ball the first time that you catch. We created chaos. 
okay, we can lose a game by that, but with the longer period of time, we're going to be more successful than, than our opponents. We can lose a game, even last game. We lost with provoking 17 turnovers. We made eight turnovers. We had 19, had 10 offensive rebounds. We had like 17 possessions more and we lost the game. It can happen. But we believe during the process and whole season that gives us benefits and we create the more advantages within the system than with something else. Well, again, great thought process in terms of you and, uh, you know, looking that in. It, would you think right now, and this is purely a hypothetical, but say someday you move to one of the biggest clubs and you have the access to the most talented players, would you feel like this system, you'd still bring it with you in terms of that? Or is this a system that applies more to you in this circumstance? And obviously we know you could coach in any circumstance, but is this something that you believe in at any level of basketball that could work? Uh, most definitely this season in in uh, champions league proved me that this can make uh, big results even on a higher level we have much better teams like with bigger budget with much better like individual players or more expensive players they were playing on a high level and uh, we get the same effect same result at the end of the day what we're getting here in poland and I'm thinking if I would get the day what we're getting here in Poland. And I'm thinking if I would get, like, let's say, bigger budget team, I would be able to get more players with the wingspans of seven foot, with the abil- athletic abilities with a, on a higher level. And those players would be even more effective within this system. Well, I, I love the idea. And obviously, I hope you get that opportunity someday. And, you know, <laughs> and again, I mean, you've said two things here that are interesting. and. We'll get into some analytics, but, you know, you've talked about, like you say, in the 1-3-1 forcing a corner three. Well, you know, the analytics say that's the shot we shouldn't give up because that's the highest percentage three-point shot. But then you've also talked about this, this concept of pressing, which, again, there's debate constantly. If I talk to anyone that's really in analytics, there's debate whether there's, there's value to pressing or stuff anymore. But ultimately, do you buy into a lot of analytics in terms of supporting what you do? And if so, what are some things with an experimental mind to say, hey, listen, let's see if this can work. And you proved it can. Well, coach, that's why I said it can be a little bit controversial, whatever I say to the guys in the States with, uh, within high school or within college where they have 35-second offenses, NBA, totally different game with uh, three second, defensive three seconds, different rules within this game. So within our our basketball that we are running, we are processing the analyzes are not kind of because who can make analyze on something that nobody did? I'm running one three one, but there is very few teams I think are running with the same details that we are running. And I cannot judge somebody else in the States or in, uh, in Europe who are running different type of uh, one three one So we cannot analyze the same. What we uh, in Europe who are running different type of uh, one three one So we cannot analyze the same. What we can analyze, we can analyze as ourselves. And I found out that during these four years, after every game, we're making analyze of our team defense and, and our individual defense. Individual defense is the group of little things that we are analyzing within our players, within our help got to position with the active hands where we want hands to be up how the players should move within the help side on a on a strong side and we having those pluses and minuses after the game so and on top of that we have the game analyze of efficiency of my defenses and within one three one defense man-to-man defense even this matchup defense whenever we were under 38 percent i'm not talking about possessions per game because there is it can be high pace game low pace game so we are talking about percentages how much we can defend on certain defense so whenever we are on a 38 percent and lower we are winning the games and our defense is kind of successful and we are making more possessions within this defense when we are 38 and over that means that we are not playing such good defense or the team find a way how to break our defense so analyze what we are running is strictly based on our own game 
And we cannot really refer to analysis of other teams because they're running, although it looked the same, but every coach has their own details, right? So it's not the same. For sure. What a great answer. Tremendous answer and uh, important, as I said, as a coach to to have your conviction and your your belief in what you do. So it's awesome. Coach, one other thing I, I want to bring up because I think it's outstanding. I think coaches, this is going to really give them something to think about is when you said in an article that you got a report to come up with something common so that you don't have to do, like you're going to do two unique things for each team in a sense, but in another sense, you're going to try and do something common for both teams so you help your team prepare better in a short turnaround. Can you talk about that? I thought that was a brilliant thing. Well, that comes up what I said earlier about my assistant coaches and the, the way that I want them to go into the scouting. We go into the scouting the last three sometimes four games of the opponents. And we find out by percentage and by the every play what they run, percentage of the plays they are most efficient on and the ones they're running the most. It doesn't always go together. Sometimes we don't prepare for the plays they run most common because they are not efficient in those. You know, sometimes, I don't know if every coach is making analysis of their own offensive sets and in which they are efficient in which they are not but we are fine running the most it doesn't always goes together sometimes we don't prepare for the plays they run most common because they are not efficient in those you know sometimes i don't know if every coach is making analysis of their own offensive sets and in which they are efficient in which they are not but we are finding uh, statistics we are finding the common basis on the, let's say, next two games. Because if I have one practice to prepare the game, I would rather have two practices to prepare two games at the same time than one practice to one game and then one practice to another game. So this way, we are trying to find possibility to have, let's say, during the week, three or four practices, which we two before the first game, but also these two before the first game can imply to the second game. And then adding... Another practice before the second game, that's already three practices that we have for the second game. So within this, when we missed within these two games together. So I think it gave us, it's not 100% efficient, but it gave us a little bit more advantage in order to prepare the games within this way than just game by game preparing. Well, I, I love the thought process and I love the way of, of doing that you know, in a sense of efficiency and, and simplicity, both those things being very important, especially if we're talking about different levels of basketball, you know, high school, youth level, basketball, AAU, basketball, whatever it may be, to give your players some commonalities to be able to focus on for the upcoming opponents definitely helps the week go. I mean, for us, for example, we play back to back Friday, Saturdays, you know, against two different opponents. And, uh, you know, without framing it that way, we certainly try and do that in terms of what we're going to work on on offense or focus on or what we're going to do on defense. So tremendous stuff. Sometimes you, you have to do that even with, without uh, players are not knowing why they're doing that. If you would say we are preparing that for not next game, but game after that, they would say, okay, we don't care about the first game. So we are trying to find common bases and prepare more for the second game within the knowing that the first game is already prepared by us because we did certain stuff earlier. So that's, I think, the process that helped us really during the season uh, so far. Uh, that's great. And it's so true that sometimes we put in stuff for the next game and we don't tell them. <laughs> that's all it's part a, of it. <laughs> yes, yes. It's all part of it. So it's great stuff. Coach, I really want to thank you for taking some time. Uh, I, I really encourage coaches to learn more about you. And, you know, as you said, you're done some tremendous stuff in coaching and you will continue to as well. So really appreciate you taking some time and sharing with us. And we look forward to following your career as you move forward. I was honored to, to talk to you. I hope that honored to, to talk to you. I hope that this was my first podcast, so I hope that I didn't too deep into the certain situations and that coaches can pick up the things that we want to discuss and explain.